Well, welcome all. My name is Seth Green, and it is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Graham School here at the University of Chicago to laying claim to the canon, a conversation with Daisy Deleju, who is the Howard Willett Professor of French Literature here at the University of Chicago. Uh, I want to virtually welcome you to our gorgeous campus. It is every bit as green and beautiful as you see in this picture today. And we are enjoying some great weather and air that we can breathe. So it is as lovely as it looks in this picture. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Graham School, we have been blazing new paths in lifelong learning for more than 130 years. We are proud to be one of the founding divisions of this university because William Rainey Harper wanted to ensure this extraordinary university's intellectual assets came to all and went well beyond the walls of our campus. And that continues to this day to be our mission, that we want to bring new paths for lifelong learners everywhere. Uh, and we do that across four domains. We have a Master of Liberal Arts that is among the most rigorous and respected in the world. We have a basic program of liberal education for adults where you can often retire to the great books and have a chance to read deeply the works of Plato and Aristotle all the way through to Toni Morrison. We have open enrollment courses and we're gonna be previewing one of those courses in a moment with Professor Deloju, who is going to be teaching about the Tempest as a case study of the canon and canonization. Uh, and then we have annual programs. And actually just in the next two months, we have one with museum professionals from across the country who wanna learn how to bring their ideas to lifelong learners. And then one around knowing your Chicago. And so this is a place that brings together lots of different ideas in different formats for different people, but with the same goal. We want everyone to be able to have access to the extraordinary ideas of this great university. Uh, but you did not come to hear from me today. You came to hear from our professor. And so I'm going to take down the slides and I will introduce Professor Deloju. She is a leading scholar of medieval literature who specializes in vernacular texts of the Middle Ages. She researches the ongoing relevance of medieval works for our own times by showing how the practices of figuration that characterizes the literary, such as metaphor and allegory, convey ideas about human political society that remain relevant. Her current book project, a monograph in progress titled The Political Pastoral, Shepherds, Sheep, and Wolves Between Late Medieval France and Burgundy, explores questions related to political organization and the exercise of power, which continue to resonate in our current moment. We are thrilled to have you here, Daisy, and very excited to have this conversation with you. And as I mentioned, you are a professor of French literature. And so I thought maybe I would start there because we're here to talk about canonicity through a case study of Shakespeare's The Tempest. And while you are the expert, um, I know enough to know that Shakespeare is British and comes out of British literature. And so I thought maybe you could speak a little bit about your research interests and how you came to engage with Shakespeare's The Tempest in the first place. Uh, thank you, Seth, and thank you for having me. Um, so I think that uh, it's true that today I'm a specialist of uh, late French medieval literature, but that is sort of through a process of narrowing and also serendipity. And I think I really started out first and foremost, as just a reader. Uh, and uh, I took courses uh, in college in English, Italian, and French literature, including a course on Shakespeare, although we did not read The Tempest, uh, because it was a course on the histories, which are also fantastic. Um, and so, you know, The Tempest is a text that I knew, and I came back around to it later and in a different way, during my graduate studies uh, in French literature, because there's a 20th century play called A Tempest. Um, it's, it's written in French, Une Tempête, uh, by Aimé Césaire. And it's a very interesting reimagination uh, of the Tempest. And so um, years later, then when I came here to Chicago, I designed a course that actually was um, first for undergraduates, and then I redesigned it for high school students, uh, 
that was about canonicity and that took those two texts kind of as um, a central pairing. Well, so, I mean, we're going to talk throughout this conversation about canonicity, and I kind of want to set the table for the rest of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me a foundational question is what qualifies as a canonical work? And maybe just to start the investigation of the Tempest, and then we'll come to a Tempest, um, why would the Tempest qualify in your mind as part of the canon? Yeah, so I think um, the canon and canonicity and great books is something that we talk about often without necessarily thinking about what it is or what that means or how it came to be. And um, so it's precisely those processes actually that interest me because I think that the canon, even the fact that we use a definite article like to talk about it implies uh, a certain monolithic quality or dimension as though the canon were immutable, had been handed down to us from time immemorial. And in fact, the canon or canons really in the plural, they, they are a product of ongoing processes of contestation and change. They're not self-evident. Um, and so I guess, why is the Tempest canonical? I mean, Shakespeare is canonical. I actually think that within Shakespeare's corpus, the Tempest to me is a bit of an oddball in some ways because it doesn't fit so neatly. I mean, it's not a tragedy, but it, it's not it's not a very comic okay. comedy. Uh, and um, so, so in some ways, it already sits a little uncomfortably alongside maybe more generically um, legible works like King Lear or Hamlet or, I don't know, some of Shakespeare's other works. Uh, so I think already from that point of view, it's interesting. Um, and then I lost track of your question. Where else were we going with canonicity? Yeah, that gives us a sense oh, of- Oh, why it's canonical. canonical. I think it's yeah. Shakespeare. It's because Shakespeare, for English language um, readers and speakers, Shakespeare is hyper canonical. I mean, that's just true. Like if you asked probably many random people to name one great author from the past, it's a name that would come up again and again. It's a name people have heard of, even if they've never read any of his plays or seen them performed. And people don't even realize the degree to which little snippets from plays from Shakespeare have just entered into our language. Uh, and so, so that I think is why Shakespeare is canonical today. Well, and if we take a broader perspective, because Shakespeare is unique in stature, and there are other books that reach the canon that may not have an author quite at that level. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how a work generally might become canonical and how you think about kind of who sets the rules and then how those decisions, if they are such, get made. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about that in contemporary terms or we could talk yeah. about it in historical terms. Do you have a preference where we start? Uh, yeah, let's talk about it today. I want to know uh, kind of how you see even people, you know, yeah. in the canon in our present day. I mean, essentially, I think the canon is a judgment about what has value, what is good, yeah. right? What is a good work of art, whether that's a work of literature or a work in some other medium. And so I think the arbiters of aesthetics uh, and quality could be things like prize committees, uh, museums, um, trying to think of reviews in journals, uh, to an interesting degree in increasingly online reviews of things, which don't, don't operate at all in the same way as yeah. you might read in the New York Review of Books or, or in the New Yorker, but which nevertheless are formulating judgments. Um, and I even think on kind of a micro level, the things that get taught, right? I mean, right. curricula are themselves an expression of what at least the instructor, uh, at a minimum, perceives to have value, perceives to be worth talking about, worth communicating to a new group of people. So I think those are those are some of the factors that that contribute to the creation of canonicity today. And they often become self-reinforcing. Well, and to your observation about online reviews now, even having force, and you know, if we compare that to 
the past. I imagine that was not a major factor. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm curious if you feel that the ways to canonicity are changing and one might say democratizing in some ways because with social media and other forms of engagement now, there's arguably more voices in the conversation. Is that something that you observe or is it still that, you know, the prize committee decides and then the rest of it is just kind of echo chambers or, you know, uh, reflections of those kind of key statements, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think, I mean, and I'm not 100% sure, right? I think that on one level, of course, like people can, like I could write my online review of The Tempest, but like there's also the question of, um, how many how many people are looking at those right and right. there are certain people as we all know who have a larger or or less um extensive online presence and yeah. so i think that even in that um on one level democratic uh space that is the internet there are nevertheless certain voices that um are are more dominant than others or reach more people than others. And I also do think that there gets to be a kind of cumulative effect where yeah. um, once a certain number of people have said, oh, X, Y, and Z is great, then it just becomes um, almost, almost like, not a fact, um, it becomes easier to reassert that, right? And so greatness, once it's been asserted a certain number of times, oh, uh, becomes becomes then its own like self-generating like ongoing great like ometer. Well I'll acknowledge that I've seen this play out in my own house because I've tried to bring great books to my daughters who are nine and twelve. Uh -huh. And it was after a Taylor Swift reference in the man to Machiavelli that I finally got to you know really talk with them about Machiavelli's theories and <laughs> Uh, she has a line, if Machiavellian, if you can. And so uh, it was a perfect entree. And so there is an example of someone from just outside of philosophy yeah. kind of influencing potentially in some small way the canon. Yeah. Um, I want to come to kind of the other side of this, which is there are benefits to the canon, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's helpful sometimes to have a set of books that lay down a set of philosophical or literary norms. They can kind of help to form what might be considered some level of kind of common cultural identity or, or, you know, vision. But there's also the other side of that, which is that they can be quite restrictive, restrictive to innovation, mm -hmm. restrictive to the creativity, restrictive to diversity. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how you have seen the canon be used to exclude or punish writers or artists who don't conform to our ideas about what is great. Yeah, so I'm not 100% sure that I would say that the canon is a good thing. Like I'm not saying it's not a good thing, but I would have right. to really think about that. I think that it often can be and can feel and can function oppressively because, because by definition, it is constituted through processes of exclusion. Not everything can be great. Right? right, or not everything can be considered canonical, and so there are always choices that are that are being made by by different people, by different actors. Um, but but fundamentally, at its base, it's about it's about winnowing down. It's about getting rid of other stuff, uh, and and very oftentimes that process of getting rid of other stuff operates along lines uh, of race, of gender, of socioeconomic class, of educational status, of religious background. And that I think is when and where and how the canon can be kind of nefarious. And so I think part of what interests me in teaching and reteaching The Tempest and A Tempest together is to give people mechanisms for dealing with the reality that is the canon, any canon, and there are many, right? There are canons in art and in literature, and you know, you could think of many. Um, it you can't not have one. It doesn't not exist. It does. Right. And so then I think the question becomes, well, what do you do with that? And if you are someone who feels that the things you find beautiful, the things you care about, or the things you produce are not appreciated, not acknowledged, um, I think that having ways kind of into the question of canon formation in an act as a as an actor, I think can feel 
more empowering. And then just there's a recent example I saw. Um, so Anne Arnaud is a contemporary French author who just won the Nobel Prize. And there was a quote from her I saw in a literary magazine. And essentially she says, men don't read female authors. Like it's as though they had not written anything, you know? It's as though they don't exist. They don't cite them. They don't invite them. They don't talk about them. They're, it's just like silence, radio silence. And she's writing this, this quote is from 2022. And so I think that these processes of, of exclusion, they're not part of a past, they're part of a present as well. Uh, and so I think that it's also those mechanisms of exclusion, I think, are something that we need to be attentive to. And interestingly, uh, canons are not necessarily forever. I mean, so to your point, um, I think we're in a moment where there is a great deal of contestation of the canon. And indeed, talking about Shakespeare, uh, just after your class, uh, which is one of our September mini classes, yeah. uh, then in late September, Chris Jones, who is uh, the longtime theater critic for Chicago Tribune, as well as an instructor at the Graham School, is going to be teaching a class on Shakespeare in an unforgiving 2023. And he's going to be looking at the critiques of Shakespeare's universality mm -hmm. and um, asking a lot of questions about whether or not it is essentially you know, the beginning of a decline for the bard and the sense that he can represent uh, kind of experience generally. And so I'm curious just, you know, if you could talk at all to, you know, how is a work eventually removed from the canon? And, you know, what does it look like to see these contestations? And do you imagine that we will continue? I mean, given the multiplicity of voices that are entering society, given the many ways in which we're seeing kind of hierarchies challenged. Do you anticipate that we will see a canon over time that looks more varied, that looks more broad? I'm curious kind of how you see the canon changing, both in terms of contestation of individual works and in terms of broadly this kind of moment of diversification of many different forms in society. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to try and track that question through multiple points. So one thing I want to talk about is the question of universality, and another is kind of inclusion representation, and then we'll see if I lost track of your question. I, so I read the little course description because you sent me the link, um, yeah. which looks really interesting. And I think the idea of universality, like Shakespeare's canonical, because his plays are universal, I'm always suspicious, actually, of claims to universality, because they, too, function by means of exclusion. Um, I mean, things things are universal because they are presumed to apply in the same way to everyone, but that's often not the case. Um, and and so I, I actually I actually don't really think that Shakespeare's works are necessarily universal, or I wouldn't even actually quite know how to say what that means in the case of Shakespeare. And I think especially when reading works from a distant or a less distant past, one can be um, hurt or offended uh, by by passages in them, and so I think for readers it can be it can be a, it can be an ambivalent, even a painful experience to read something that doesn't feel good, uh, but that is great, yeah. um, and so I think. I think that for me, reading those works, uh, my answer would not be like, oh, well, we shouldn't read them or, oh, well, we shouldn't teach them. Like that is not where, that's not where I would go. But I think that they also need to be grappled with. And so one of the things like, oh, quickly on syllabi. So like, when I designed syllabi, I really purposefully, and it's not that easy for the middle ages because a lot of things are anonymous. And there aren't that many female authors because literacy levels are very low overall and they're particularly low among women. And nevertheless, it's something that I really make a point of, that I really make a point of trying to have a syllabus that is as representative as I can make it of the people who were actually living in whatever time period I am teaching. Um, I think that, I, I just think that that's sort of ethically important. And so um, back to the question of like, what should we do with stuff? I mean, we're in a moment where we're seeing proposals or actions to, to re-edit books, to edit out language. And that's a move I don't agree with. I do though think that it would be really useful in the case of some books that 
contain language that today we wouldn't use. Um, but nevertheless, it's part of that book, maybe to have a preface, maybe to have footnotes, maybe to, again, I think it's about discussing what it is in those books that is problematic and why, why was it not a problem in 1867, but it's a problem now. Um, I think that those are opportunities to think about what, what is in those books. Um, and so for me, like just sort of erasing things, yeah, is, is just not useful actually. And what you're gonna erase then or, or not read or not engage with is or are works that have value, you know? So I think it's not as easy as just, you know, including, excluding. I think what would be really helpful actually is to think of the of canonicity, not as the, as something in more flexible terms, something that is yeah. alive or that is multiple. I think that would go a long way. Yeah. Well, so we're going to come to questions and we have many of them in the chat. And so I'm going to start with one from Jennifer Lynn. Uh, she asked, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, Daisy, but can you speak to Columbia University's 2019 Butler Banner, which was a project where they added the names of underrepresented authors to their permanent banner of authors, writers, philosophers, such as Aristotle, Plato, and Shakespeare? Um, are you familiar or even, you know, able to comment on that idea of, you know, here's a banner that it sounds like was a permanent fixture, it was just going to have, you know, these uh, white male authors, and now they've been able to showcase these other great authors and begin to bring some diversity. Uh, thoughts or reactions to that project? I mean, I'm not familiar with that specific uh, instance, but conceptually, I think that canons do need to be and benefit from being opened up. And so, if they're adding um, additional figures, I think, I think. In my opinion, that is a that is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Satan uh, asked, can anything become canonical in its current time? Wouldn't that be the annual best books list? Isn't time and enduring value important? And yeah, can you talk a little bit about this idea of time and horizon? Yeah. Because, you know, in art, you know, there are these artists who live poor and they're not loved until you know, after their time and just how you see, you know, time and canonicity in that relationship. Yeah, it's very interesting, actually, the question of time, because things can come in and drop out and sometimes come back in. Yeah. And so, um, so here, here are two examples. One is uh, Dante, who is also like Shakespeare, hyper canonical, and in particular in an Italian context. Uh, and in his time, Dante had not necessarily, like, I mean, in his lifetime, because it, his canonicity starts pretty soon after his death. Um, he, he is one poet of many poets. His poetry is circulating with and alongside other works by peers uh, and certainly is appreciated but but not with the same degree of um, exaltation as as he is maybe read or or appreciated today. And so when I say his canonicity began soon after his lifetime, practically the minute he dies, Boccaccio was another Italian author, uh, author of the Decameron, um, writes a life of Dante, and it, which is also a kind of interpretation of the Commedia. And so he really begins right away to diffuse um, a knowledge of familiarity with and also appreciation for Dante's Commedia. And then there's another author who's actually roughly a contemporary of Dante's, a female author who's extremely prolific uh, in her lifetime and whose patrons include I would say many of the figures from the upper nobility and the royalty of both France and England, they're translated into multiple languages. Uh, they exist in many copies. And then it's like she falls off a cliff. <laughs> and, and for a really, I would say quite a long time does is, is little read, is little circulated. And to some degree, a really important temporal change has to do with print. And mm -hmm. what winds up getting put into print 
and what doesn't. And yeah. so the choices that are made, editorial choices, really, and commercial choices also, like, let's be frank, um, that are made over the 16th century, really like kind of the century when print culture comes into its own, those are hugely consequential for future yeah. canonicity. The medieval authors who don't wind up in print, um, they, many of them just, they just go underground. Uh, whereas the ones who do wind up uh, in print continue then to be read. So this particular author um, really kind of disappears more or less for a very long time, not 100%, but. Uh, and then I would say um, she begins a little bit to be rediscovered in the 19th century, which is a really important period for medieval literature of editing of uh, going back to manuscripts and editing them and publishing them for scholarly publics, basically, not really for wide readership. And so she is at the same time um, edited, but also kind of denigrated. And so it's like, oh, we're editing the work by this author, Christine de Pizan, someone asked in the chat, I saw, that's her name. Uh, we're editing this work, but it's really pretty bad. <laughs> so you're kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> why are you editing it? Uh, and then I would say she has a sort of second moment maybe in, maybe starting in the 80s, uh, the 1980s, where she's really rediscovered by scholars. And then, I mean, in the intervening decades then has become like a cottage industry. There are a zillion books uh, on Christine de Pizan and conferences and her works have been re-edited and they've been translated into English. Uh, and so there is, to my mind, a very illustrative example of how someone's fortunes with regard to the canon can really rise and fall quite dramatically over, yeah. over a long period of time. Well, and I think it speaks to our eagerness to find ourselves in literature. And so if we do even hundreds of years later, then it may have greater meaning than at another moment. And it also is interesting just to come back to your mention of the printing press. I know there's been a lot written about Shakespeare's own relationship because he comes of age as an author just as printing presses are yeah. starting and yeah. so they're looking for material and you know his works become along with the bible some of the first that are in printing presses and you know that is probably a big advantage to be early yes. in the adoption of, of that new technology that's absolutely true and i think is a huge factor uh in his his kind of city today not the only one but certainly yeah. a major factor yeah uh, Greg Gosick says, differentiating the aesthetic and the political in judging a work of art is an issue that has been addressed by Plato, if not earlier. Is the market-like system we have to resolve this any worse than an approach via authoritative institutions a la the French Academy? I think that those are often, I don't think those can be necessarily separated, you know, yeah. Uh, I mean, kind of is part of the market. You know, and the not to say that they necessarily are working together or in tandem, um, but just to say that they are both operating. And so they mm -hmm. can't either one of them be discounted. I mean, I think the same market forces that led editors in the 16th century to make decisions about what they thought would sell are the exact same kinds of calculations and choices that that publishing houses today are making, right? Or any kind of business. Like, what are people going to want? What are people going to be interested in? That's that's a factor because, because books, in addition to having a content, are also a product. They have a materiality. Uh, there is a cost to producing them. Um, and someone has to bear those costs. So that is clearly, definitely a whole dimension. Uh, and then like the Académie Française um, or, or prize committees or other kind of high culture um, forces can can also uh, have an influence. And the Académie Française is an interesting example because it's often a kind of policing function. I mean, one of the first uh, realms of action of the Académie Française was to condemn this play and say that it didn't conform to like the, the rules for tragedy. <laughs> and so I think um, they were often intervening to say what works should or shouldn't look like. Um, which is kind of an interesting, an interesting role. And then I think the other regulatory body that we see acting in different uh, spaces and times differently, sometimes with a greater degree of intervention, sometimes less, is um, censorship. I mean, the, the French government had the index and there were just books that were banned, right? Um, and they weren't the same books all the time. Uh, for example, during the wars of religion, the works of Kelvin were banned because France had declared itself a Catholic nation. 
Uh, and so I think that those governmental regulatory forces uh, also cannot be discounted in terms of uh, canon formation. Another question we have from Jennifer is, are canonical works limited to adult works? And she's curious about the relationship with K to eight or K to 12 literature. And I mean, I'm even thinking as basic as, you know, when I used to read my kids, Good Night Moon. Now, admittedly, yeah. uh, there's very little content in that book, but I mean, it was very widely circulated. It had been used for generations. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about what canonicity means as you think about, you know, kind of books across the younger ages. I mean, I would definitely not say it's limited to adult works. I think absolutely. And like your example of Good Night Moon is, is a great one. Yes. Um, and yeah, I think that children's literature, it's a body of work, just like works intended for adults. And there are also a great many works that really cross over. Uh, I mean, I think sometimes uh, younger people are reading books that perhaps others might think of as for an older audience. Sometimes adults are reading, I don't know, the Harry Potter series or Tolkien. And, and I think, uh, I mean, as you've just suggested, I think one of, for me, one of the joys of having children was getting to reread <laughs> all the books like from my own childhood that I really loved. Uh, and sometimes it's interesting to see actually for your own self, just as an individual, like which of those books aged well and which like, do you wanna hide behind the couch so your child forgets about them, <laughs> you know? But I think that there, are, I think the same kinds of forces uh, are at work in children's literature, children and adolescent literature as in adult literature. Uh, Jerry asks, and I'll read his question directly, although I will take issue with one of the words in here because I know him. Uh, how do you see canons working to help educate us stupid people? He is actually not at all stupid, so that is uh, not a true statement, uh, but why hasn't it worked for me, Plato Shakespeare? Um, I guess I just think of like, what is the role of a canon in education, like uh, period? Um, I think what do I think? I think it has a certain utility. I mean, in works that are have been considered part of the canon, it's not for it's not for nothing, you know. Right. Like I was teaching earlier um, this year, Aristotle, and Aristotle says lots of things you could disagree with, but he also says lots of things that are extremely interesting and also extremely influential. And so sometimes if you wanna understand what later people have written in whatever domain, whether it's literature or philosophy or you know, another, I mean, writers are also readers, right? First and foremost. And yeah. so I think that being familiar with works that many, many, many people have read um, I think it helps one as a reader to perceive connections. In some ways, I think that um, that literature, it's almost like almost like a giant party that people keep coming to, you know? And so if you wanna understand the conversations going on around you, it's really helpful to, to meet some of the people or like know some of the conversations that were happening before you arrived. Um, wow. Yeah, and so I think, World of canons, but again, I think that I I really do think that canons also need to be sort of like handled handled with care. I think greatness can't just be like, well, this is great, so you have to like it. Like, actually, you don't have to like it. One of the works that I have worked on in my scholarship a lot is like, in some places, frankly, just horrible. Like, the author says things that are horrible, uh, and I cannot like that author. I can find certain passages, long passages, offensive, deeply offensive, and even um, nefarious. But I can still, at the same time, find that work of near endless interest, um, and, and it can help me think about things, and, and it is worth, to me, reading. And so I think that being able to have, and it being just okay to have actually a conflicted relationship. Oh, it's the romance of the rose to Ernst. Um, <laughs> a conflicted relationship to canonical works. I think like that is totally legitimate. And I would say, actually, I have a very conflicted relationship to the Tempest. There's a lot of the Tempest yeah. that, that, that I don't find likable, you know, but you don't have to like everything. You cannot like something. And you can also think things, are, are very, very interesting without liking them. 
Well, on that note, um, Mark has in the chat from earlier that Roosevelt Montas, a first generation college educated and American citizen, wrote a wonderful book, Rescuing Socrates. And it in some ways is part of this bigger debate that we participate in at the Graham School because of our love of the basic program of liberal education for adults about mm -hmm. how do we treat these great texts that, as you said, are foundational to the way that many of us see the world still today and are part of this long conversation. At the same time, they don't represent a universality of experiences and they do potentially limit you know, your ability to see all these other perspectives. And there's been obviously a debate that has gone on, especially in recent years. Um, people from the university have been uh, really important forces in that debate. I think of Shadi Bark Zimmer and uh, her piece in the Washington Post a couple of years ago about kind of how you can maybe challenge, but also love these books. And um, I mean, it sounds like you may come out in a somewhat similar place of, you know, read them, but with an eye toward grappling with these subjects rather than, you know, throw them out. Yeah. I think that one of the important things for me about teaching works that are canonical and in particular teaching them to some of the very people who might feel alienated by those works is to, potentially offer a sense of, of not ownership exactly, but um, not to just feel crushed by them. You know what I mean? Right. I th I'm thinking now of the high teaching I've done with high school students. Um, and, uh, and, you know, presumably they're headed off to college. And I think that names like Shakespeare or Plato or other people like big names, can feel just sort of scary and like, oh, people, people I've heard of, people that are great, but people who I'm not like and don't like me. And I think that can feel hostile, you know? And so I think to have read them and have sort of taken them apart and looked at them like, like you're like you're doing an autopsy, but like you're doing a kind of like a kind of dissection. Like that's how, I mean, that's how I like to also engage with literary works is by really looking closely at what are they saying? How are they saying it? What is the impact of that? I think going through that process can then make someone feel not like they're being crushed by Shakespeare, but like they too have something to say about Shakespeare. They can have an opinion that's their opinion founded on their reading and their thinking about that text. Well, that's a good segue to the final question I wanted to ask you, because, you know, talking about how people can read these texts and come to their own formed opinions, you will be teaching a class where you will be reading The Tempest, you will be reading A Tempest. And I'm curious, I mean, this is a lot to take on in a mini course version. Uh, and so could you talk a little bit about kind of how you'll approach teaching your class in September? Yeah, so it's a three session um, course and basically for the first session, people will have read The Tempest. That's our that's our point of departure. So it's not really a course about The Tempest or at least not exclusively. Um, and then the second work that we read is uh, one that I alluded to earlier. It's Aimé Césaire's A Tempest. Uh, and then the third is a film actually. It's Julie Taymor's um, film version of The Tempest. And the reason I like César and um, the Julie Taymor film version is that they both very directly and very explicitly engage with some of the most uncomfortable features of Shakespeare's original, which are around questions of gender and race. And so I think that those, those, two, those two works really like crack open some of what people can maybe be interested in talking about in Shakespeare. Um, but also they offer two models. They offer two models for how you can really carefully read and engage with the work and then make, reappropriate it essentially. Make something new that is yours, that is in dialogue with, but is not somehow subservient to that other work. I think that for, for creatives, um, whether literary or in other media, I think that acts of reappropriation are, I think are, are not just empowering for them and for readers, but I think are also extremely important creative processes. Well, because it allows you to contest the canon directly, I think, rather than 
just have, you know, kind of things on the side of it. Yeah. Uh, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Um, thank you so much, Daisy, for taking the time. Um, thanks to the thank outstanding questions. Me. Oh, yeah, please. Let me give you the last word. Oh, I, that was really, <laughs> that was my last word. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you all for attending and for your questions. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to talk about something that um, is of a lot of interest to me and, and I gather to you as well. Yes, and I uh, just want to echo the thanks. We're grateful to have such an incredible community of learners. We'll send out after this uh, the information on Professor Delogio's upcoming class. Um, I think it will be one that challenges as well as uh, grapples with the canon in really exciting ways. So um, thank you for being a role model of the very practices that, that you're describing. Uh, and have good uh, almost afternoons uh, to all of you. Bye.